the increased prosperity of the 1950s helped the proliferation of television sets and coincided with what some regard as the start of the golden age of television. One of the most popular programmes of the time was called Tonight. It was offbeat and irreverent and has been endlessly copied and imitated ever since. Tonight departed from the prevailing institutional correctness of the BBC and confronted the orthodox notion that TV should be either serious or entertaining. Tonight contrived to be both. Some nine million viewers would tune in every weekday evening at five past six to watch Cliff Mitchellmore and his team. This included Alan Wicker, who began his globe-trotting role on Tonight. The team recognised that attitudes were changing and sought to reflect this in their informal style. The columnist Bernard Levin said, Fewers wanted tonight and wanted it that way because it was helping to shape the mood and attitude of the country. Let's join Cliff and the team at the BBC's Lime Grove Studios for a typical edition of tonight from April 1959. <laughs> Five minutes later, I thought you were all listening to the arches or something. A to Z tonight at nine o'clock. It looks as though ours is A to Z tonight too, beginning with the letter F. Football, fallout, flowers, France, fishing and Phi Grant. Field Marshal Lord Montgomery appeared on American TV. Field Marshal Lord Montgomery appeared on American TV. The things he said. Turn the faces red, he suggested American blood be shed. The briefest comment to date was the president's round of 108. We bring you the news you ought to know in tonight's topical calypso. For the start of Bracia's wedded bliss, as Usher he had the other Chris. For the start of Bracia's wedded bliss, as Usher he had the other Chris. But Charaway went slightly astray and very nearly missed the wedding day. So Bracia won the race, his very first church and steeplechase. Tomorrow, a man travels down to London from his home in Bolton to keep a date with 15 million people. That's about the number who will see him this Saturday on television or in the flesh. Though he'll be, one hopes, very much in the background. He is the referee of the cup final, Mr Jack Clough. And tonight, he's waiting in our studio in the north. Now, Mr Clough, playing and playing, I'm told, in a cup final is a pretty nerve-wracking experience for the players. But how nervous are you, the referee, before you go? Well, I'm just treating this as quite an ordinary game. I I've been to Wembley on two previous occasions, and I, I know the feeling of the stadium, and I I'm looking forward to it, and I I'm not unduly nervous. Well, the players themselves must be pretty nervous, particularly in the early stages. How much allowance do you make for this nerviness? Well, I, I don't think it's just as apparent from a referee's point of view as a lot of people imagine. They, they react as we do, there's a settling down period, but there's no dirty player usually involved, it's just a settling down which automatically just gets on its level very quickly. We hear a great deal about the, the Wembley turf sapping the energy of the players. Uh, it isn't until this moment that I've thought that it may sap your energy as well. Well, it does indeed. I, I should say it's the most difficult ground in the world on which to run. One finds that that there's a kind of lusciousness about it which is tantamount to a bowling green. And when you get a deep stud, there's a difficulty in turning. And it's dragging these studs out of the ground so frequently that brings on this cramp which many players complain of during the course of the game. And it certainly affects the referee to the same, same extent as it does the players. Now, it's of course a very great honour indeed for anyone to referee in the cup final. Is it always uh, an honour that goes to a referee such as yourself who are on the point of retirement? Oh dear, no. No, many referees have had it much earlier in their career. I understand that I've been rather unfortunate, at least the press tell me so, although the FA have never told me just as much. But geographical considerations come into it. The teams obviously must be considered. Oh, you're a and man of Lancashire, I see. And the, the Lancashire teams are always there. Mr. Clough, 
Can I, can I do, deal with two of your duties in the cup final? One is the selection of the ball, which is your job, isn't it? That's true. How do you sit about this? How do you tell a good ball from, the, from a bad ball? Well, in the main, we go down to Lancaster Gate early in the, about 11 o'clock on Saturday morning, mm -hmm. and there is a selection of footballs there. There's no identification of the manufacturer at all. Mm -hmm. And it's personal choice. You select one, two, and three, the number one being obviously the match ball, and if anything unfortunate happens to it, you rely on number two and number yeah. three if need be. But uh, I would say uh, I look for the strength of a ball more mm. in the... The number of panels always influence me, and the more there are, the more strength it appears to give to a football. I may tell you that uh, the referees themselves can either take a ten, ten guinea fee for having refereed the cup final, or they can have a gold medal. Mr. Clough was telling me earlier that he's going to take the gold medal. Now we move on and join Alan Wicker in Canada. Last night, you may remember, he reported from the graveyard of the Canadian Pacific Railway locomotives. Tonight, he again finds himself amongst the relics of the North American past. Hello. Do you ever get the feeling that you're being followed? Well, <laughs> this chap is a brontosaurus, 125 tons of him. He lived right here in North America about 165 million years ago. And he's the largest land animal ever. The largest animal ever is alive today. It's a blue whale. Now this is what they call a dinosaur park in Calgary, Alberta. And if you'd like to follow me for a few minutes, we'll step back through 230 million years. The oldest land animal, the granddaddy of them all, was the Eriops. It plodded around something over 200 million years ago, and it was an amphibian. This one has that disapproving look, as though he could guess what he was going to start. The Seymouria was the intermediate stage between the amphibians and the reptiles. One of the largest of the early reptiles was the Moscops a distressingly unattractive chap with the world's first collection of double chins, which, unfortunately, have been handed down 200 million years to, um, to some of us. He was also a plant eater, which shows you didn't lose much weight by eating salads in those days. Another plant eater was the Edaphosaurus, and note that self-satisfied grin, the grin of a flashy fellow who knows he's much more flamboyant than the next reptile. The first meat-eater on this world was the Dimetrodon, and isn't nature wonderful? Just look at those teeth. All the better to eat you with. All the later dinosaurs developed from this Saltopasuchus, found in Europe some 200 million years ago, and a pretty unprepossessing ancestor for any self-respecting dinosaur to have, I'd say. For an armor-plated dinosaur, you couldn't beat the Stegosaurus, as big as an elephant, but with a brain the size of a warning. Thick-skinned and stupid, you know the type. This one's stupid too, with knobs on. The Uintatherium was the largest animal of its time, but it had absolutely no brain at all, and no looks either, come to that. The Bronotops also lost a lot of face. It was found in America fairly recently, that is, only 40 million years ago, but it obviously couldn't face the pace of life here, and it soon died out. The Titanotherium was, believe it or not, a plant eater. On the other hand, the Cerasaurus was a big meat-eater 165 million years ago. And so was the Allosaurus, the most fierce dinosaur of its age. The Gorgosaurus was a meat-eater, but so unfortunately for this one was the Tyrannosaurus, who was also much bigger and fiercer and, it seems, hungrier. They both lived in North America around 100 million years ago, and apparently they just didn't get along. The Styracosaurus lived about the same time, and so did the Pachyrhinoceros, and both of them are quite prehistoric enough for me. So from the Calgary Dinosaur Park, good night, and uh, pleasant dreams. Jeffrey Johnson Smith. Radioactive fallout from hydrogen tests. And once again, the question of radioactive contamination is in the news. Now this time, through an assurance by Mr. Macmillan in the House of Commons yesterday, 
that although the rate of fallout in this country has doubled during the last year, the concentration of the dangerous substance strontium-90 in bone is unlikely to approach danger level. And also yesterday, the American uh, scientist, Dr. Linus Pauling, said in New York that amounts of strontium-90, now judged permissible, could cause every thousandth child in an entire generation to die of cancer of the blood. Well, tonight then, I'm going to question Dr. Peter Alexander of the Chester Beatty Institute for Cancer Research about this complete divergence of these opinions. Now, Dr. Pauling has been making these uh, rather terrifying statements for a number of years, Dr. Alexander. Now, what evidence has he to, for his conclusions? Well, he has no direct experimental evidence because in the laboratory, one cannot use sufficient animals to measure a very, very small risk. What, in essence, he does is that is that from laboratory experiments one knows, say, that uh, 100 units of radiation will give uh, 10 out of every 100 mice cancer or leukemia. What, this is the fact. What Dr. Pauling then does is he says, well, now if we go to one unit of radiation, we say one in every 1,000 mice will get cancer, or if we go to 0.01 units, the sort of level with, with, with which one deals in fallout problems, will give one in every 100,000 leukemia mm -hmm. or cancer. So in other words, he's, it's, he's sort of going, extrapolating from what he doesn't, from what he knows up here to what he doesn't know there. Yes, in, in what we say a linear extrapolation. Mm -hmm. This is what he does. On, on the other hand, is there any evidence to show uh, that Dr. Pauling is in fact wrong. I mean, he is a, a Nobel Prize winner for chemistry after all, not likely to make any simple elementary mistake, is there? Well, um, this is uh, the very difficult problem, you see. In most cases of poison and so on, one cannot make a linear extrapolation. This is everyday experience. If we know, if somebody takes a dose of arsenic which kills nearly everyone, and then a hundredth of that dose doesn't, doesn't kill one in a hundred. It, it harms no one. We take it in tonics. So for most poisons, this isn't true. But on the other hand, there are some special features in radiation poisoning which makes this a special case. And so one cannot say categorically that he's either right or wrong. So in fact, then, it's guesswork on both sides. Absolutely, yes. We, we, uh, we have no reason for... Uh, it, it, it's a personal choice whether one adapts the threshold hypothesis, that is the one which doesn't believe this, or the linear hypothesis, which, which is the one Pauling uses. Well, that being so, uh, wouldn't it be rational to take the rather pessimistic view of Dr. Pauling? Yes, I think uh, uh, that certainly seems to be, the, the, in my view, the right attitude to take. But before we get frightfully hot under the collar about this, I think we ought to bear in mind that this strontium-90 radiation isn't I any different from the sort of radiation to which we are always exposed merely by living on this earth, which is full of radium in the ground and so on. So we get a lot of radiation from what is known the background, from the food we eat, from the water we drink, from the air we breathe and so on. Now this amount of radiation is very, very much greater than the amount of radiation contributed by fallout, and what's more, it varies from place to place. It's much greater in, say, Aberdeen than London, because Aberdeen has got granite which contains more radium than the soil around London. So, say, a trip by you or me to, to Aberdeen for two or three weeks in the year would, be, would give us a dose of radiation equal to that received from fallout. But the Aberdonians are all right. That's right, yes. Nonetheless, though, there is a possibility, isn't there, of loss of life from radioactive fallout. Oh yes, uh, of, of that there can be absolutely no doubt. There is a distinct uh, uh, danger that, that, that some people will get killed from, uh, from fallout. Some people will get cancer. But the numbers may be, uh, the numbers Pauling uses are large because the population of the world is large. But the risk for anyone in particular may be very small or not at all. But in, the there sense, is a in the sense of the kind of risk that uh, people who will suffer from bronchitis will suffer from the effect of smoke or... Oh, oh, smoke oh or no, that. I think bronchitis is much worse. You see, this is why fallout is a problem, but it isn't nearly as great a problem as some of the other things men do. I mean, the mere fact that we burn coal and pollute the atmosphere causes, I don't think Pauling would deny this, very, very much more suffering and, and deaths than fallout could possibly do on the worst possible assumptions. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Alexander. Turn to music.
A lot of you, I'm sure, may have started your first piano lessons with Beethoven's Minuet in G. If your next door neighbour has just started playing it, you'll be fed up with it. But uh, we thought that you'd like to hear this instead, arranged for mandolin and played by our regular Wednesday contributor, Hugo Dalton. <laughs> should sound like, played by Hugo Dalton and Rex Stevens. As we need hardly tell you, the polo season has just started in this country to the unbounded joy of all polo enthusiasts. You'll see that it's also just started in France. The French who invented the guillotine and the hot air balloon have now come up with a third important contribution to the welfare of mankind. Here you see demonstrated, probably for the first time in your life, monocycle polo. It at last solves the problem of how to preserve the exclusivity of polo without going to the expense of a string of ponies. Any suspicion of its being a sport reserved for the upper classes is now removed. French genius has thrown polo open to anyone who can ride a monocycle. According to the rules, you're out of the game while your foot is on the ground. This also applies to your face. And just in case people who are not quite gentlemen should start to flood the world's monocycle polo pitches, there's a special rule prohibiting a player from putting his mallet through the spokes of another player's wheel. At the moment, however, there are only two teams in the world, and a team consists of just three players and a reserve. And you can't be much more exclusive than that. The Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Monocycles is believed to have protested. But the players insist that so far from being cruel, the monocycles actually enjoy it. I'm told that the name of the society in this country is the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Unicycles. The monocycle society is the French one. And now Geoffrey Johnson Smith. Well, in Paris at this moment, they're holding the biggest international display of flowers ever. The exhibits from all over the world cover 18 acres. And as with all flower shows, there were prizes to be won. The Supreme Gold Cup for the best arrangement of flowers went to an English woman who nearly didn't enter and who, while the judges were studying the exhibits, went on boating on the Seine. She's Mrs. Joan Compton of Winchelsea, Sussex. 
Her wedding entry is, of course, still in Paris, so we spent the best part of the afternoon uh, gathering together as many of the various flowers and plants you used in it, and we'd like to see, Mrs. Compton, just how you arrange them. Well, I hope I can arrange them again. In a now, what we did yet uh, was Father Giller. Father Giller, yes. Mm -hmm. right. That's a shrub, of course. Begonia yes. rex. Yes. Oh, Begonia rex. I'm going to use this. And the Sandra Grande. Grandy, rather, rhododendrons. Leaves, which are these. Leaves. Which I've turned back to front, because I like the back bit on the front. And another shrub, the forest species I was told of Pieris. Yes, which I'm using now. These. Well, it seems to be shaping up very nice. You weren't all that confident about going to Paris, were you? I mean, <laughs> Not a bit. I didn't want reluctant. to I didn't want, well, I wanted to go to Paris, but I didn't want to enter. My husband, for some strange reason, said that I ought to. So, being a dutiful wife, I did. But you didn't even turn up for the judging. Well, I didn't think I had a chance. I thought I would rather go on the same. I knew it was going to be very crowded at the show, and I thought I'd go to the show on, on Friday, on Saturday. Mm -hmm. Nine o'clock, I thought, more suitable time. So I didn't go near the, sh near the show. I'm told that you arranged these lovely flowers in a simple, humble cake tin. Why do you think the judges liked your entry so much? Well, I hope they didn't see the cake tin. I tried to hide it, and I think I did. What did they tell you about the exhibit today? Did I they didn't know. I wasn't there. I was on the scene. <laughs> All the time? Didn't yes. anyone give you any idea? Wouldn't you like to have been there while they were judging it? Well, in some ways. But in some ways, I think perhaps I was better away. I understand there was a certain amount of temperament, a certain amount of tears, charming young Frenchman told me when I did appear on Saturday that um, he'd been very puzzled. He'd been helping with this arrangement competition and he'd been really rather worried because he told me that the only way he knew uh, or thought he knew how to cope with women in tears was to kiss them. And he said that really he didn't feel he ought to do that. He thought it might make <laughs> thing rather worse. <laughs> what a flower show. Well, thank you very much indeed, <laughs> Mrs. Compton, and congratulations on winning this fantastic prize. I can hardly believe it myself. Well, you'll believe it when you see the cup again. <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank you again. 11 o'clock on Saturday evening, I may say, Polly Elwes and Percy Thrower will show you the winning exhibits direct from Paris. Next, we move north of the border or rather to the borders of both England and Scotland, that's where the River Tweed joins the sea. Fife Robertson was in those parts recently, meeting fishermen in the towns of Seahouses and Berwick. It's seven o'clock and a fine peaceful morning at Seahouses in Northumberland. This place and other fishing communities along this coast are facing hard times just now because the white fishing is so poor. It's so bad, in fact, that some of the men to make a living have turned to salmon fishing. They're out there now, heading for harbour after a night at sea, and I'm waiting to talk to them because there's a bit of dispute in these parts about salmon fishing. Oh, good morning. What kind of a night's nice fishing have you had? Oh, just very moderate, I should think. How many, how many salmon did you catch? Oh, we had nine salmon last night. Nine salmon last night. Oh, is that a good night? Oh, well, uh, no, it's just a moderate night, just a moderate fishing, yes. H how many men have you brought to share that catch? Oh, we've got f four men. See? But what about whitefish? Have you any idea why? There are so few. Oh, well, I think it's... Uh, quite a bit of overfishing, and, and mainly, I should say, that the foreign tallers that fish on our coasts during the summer months. 
supposedly mm. to be catching heron instead of which they destroy an enormous amount of small whiting and haddock and codfish. I see. That aren't marketable. Yeah. And has it really been very bad here this season? Yes, it's been a very bad season indeed. Well, what, what do you mean by bad? How low did earnings get at its worst? Oh, well, it got so bad that uh, it, it wasn't any use at all going to fish at all, you see. So the boats were only coming in with uh, two or three boxes of fish in a day. The mm. Expenses nowadays are so very heavy, you just can't do it. Well, but do you think salmon fishing will get you out of your difficulties? Well, it would do. I, well, provided we get a proper sort of weather and the condition mm -hmm. is just right, we could make a... As far as we can see, on the results this last two or three weeks, we could make a fair living. The difficulty for these fishermen is that an act of parliament, the Tweed Act, protects an area extending five miles out to sea for the sole use of people holding fishing rights on the river. The men on the coast here are not allowed to fish in those productive waters. Good morning, Skipper. Good morning. They tell me you're from Burnmouth. Yes. But that's in Scotland, isn't it? Yes, it's just three miles on our side of the border. Now, would it make much difference to you if you could fish anywhere for salmon? Well, uh, that part, you see, that five mile limit, I mean, that is ridiculously outside the area for salmon fishing, anyway. Is it better nearer the mouth of the river? Well, some nights, if you get a wild night, I mean, you, the, the salmon seeks the fresh water on the wild nights, and you're better nearer the river. Now, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to get the act repealed? Well, I would say that uh, the ark should be brought in, the area should be brought into about a square mile. I mean, uh, we don't want to go right up the river, but I mean, uh, the seven mile stretch and the five mile outside is a bit ridiculous. But supposing everybody was allowed to fish, you know, anywhere, uh, might there not be a danger of overfishing and spoiling the thing? Well, uh, the salmon has a, a big scope in the sea compared with the river. Uh -huh. I don't think that you're liable for the overfish it in the sea compared think, with the river. No, there's enough for everybody. Yes, I would say so. In there. Now, as I understand it, international law bans fishing within three miles of the shore, but the Tweed Act bans it five miles from the shore. Isn't that so? Well, to us fellows, it's banning us five miles from the shore, but a foreign boat can come in there and fish. Well, you to, couldn't fish. Well, we can't fish. Well, now, what would happen if you fished inside the five mile and outside the three mile limit? Well, to be quite honest about it, I think that we'll be up for the hammer right away. Have you ever thought of fishing within the five mile limit to see what happens? Yes, we could try it, but whose pocket's going to, uh, the money going to come out, come out of to fight this action? A fisherman couldn't stand up to that. That's e even if they combined, could they not stand up to it? Well, uh, that's an opinion of the rest of the men that only moon, isn't yeah. it? Now, what do you think about this? Wouldn't you agree that there must have been a good reason for passing the Tweed Act? Oh, it was just the laws of the manor and the squires. People had a bow down to them. They had the money, they've still got it. But aren't there a lot of men earning their living fishing for salmon in the Tweed? There's a lot of men employed, but there's just as many men employed in the inshore fishermen. Yeah, but it's not just a case of the rich man versus the poor man, is it? There are, what, 150 salmon fishers ah, well. employed and, and, and they're in the river. Aye, but, well, what will be a fisherman on the coast? Well, but aren't you afraid, or aren't they afraid, that if you all fished just outside the mouth, you see, they'd lose their work? Oh, no, they couldn't lose their work. We'd only catch what we can drift. You what think... Go what goes up the river, they get. We don't want the river, we only want what belongs to the open sea. That's a both white, and that's what we claim. So why we can't fish in the open sea, I do not know. Mr. Wilson, as spokesman and champion for the fishermen here, can you tell me why they've taken so long to discover that the Tweed Act is unfair? It's not been necessary. The fishermen here are having such a poor time that they've had to try something else. Mm -hmm. And that big be is open, as far as I should say, to any inshore fisherman. Why should that be? allowed to be kept for so few, as many as I can count on my hands. Surely the act wasn't passed to protect them, but to protect the salmon. Do you mean to tell me that they're trying to protect salmon? Catching them by the thousands, four thousand on two fisheries in one more, in one twenty-four hours? Never in the mind of man. 
You That's a law for themselves, that is. Are you sure there'd be enough salmon for everybody if everybody was allowed to fish? Yes, there would be enough salmon. There's salmon go up that river every year to die. I'd put in through the press that there was 30 ton taken out and buried at on one occasion. Why, why is that? Because I know you used to know that they're, they're just going to waste. But they're, burying, to... they're burying salmon every year. But they go up there to spawn, They go they? up there to spawn and they don't spawn until October, from October till December. I see. And the salmon that are going up there now, they're very, very, well, I should say that they should be caught. If they're not they, caught, they'll if die. They're not, if they're not caught, they'll die. Good luck to them. Let them, let them catch them. Let them, let let them catch them. The that sea belongs to us, you know. And God put the salmon into that sea for man, not for certain individuals. No, no. Let the, let the poor fishermen have, have a chance. Don't debar them. They have hard enough to work for anything they get. And it's poverty that sent them to try to get salmon. I've come now to Berwick, where they fish under the protection of the Act, to hear the other end of this dispute. First, I'm going to talk to Mr. Reed, who is the manager of the Berwick Salmon Fishing Company. Mr. Reed, what kind of a season are you having? Oh, very good season up to now. What did you catch last year, for instance? Well, uh, last year the value of my company's catch was £76,000. By Joe, that's fishing. You know, I've just come from sea houses where one boat was out all night for seven salmon. What do you think about that? Well, you've got to remember, of course, that my company paid over £30,000 in wages last year, all of which is spent in the town and district. Uh -huh. But you will admit that these sea houses inshore fishermen are having a pretty tough time this time. Oh, maybe so, yes. Well, maybe so. Would it really make any difference to your fishing if they were allowed to fish in Yes, I think it would. They would catch more fish, and that, well, that would affect the fish coming into the river to going up to the spawning bread. Mm -hmm. But how can you be sure of that, Mr. Ray? Well, we know that because uh, during the war, when there was wholesale poaching, when the bailiffs were away on service, we had bad seasons, uh, very bad seasons after the war. But wouldn't you be willing to let them try it one year, say, and see what happens? I would say not, no. No. Mr. Ryan is superintendent of the Tweed Commissioners, and the Commissioners are the people who own the fishing rights in the Tweed. Mr. Ryan, the people at the net seem to be doing pretty well today. Yes. Don't you think the sea houses fishermen might be right when they say there's enough salmon for everybody? Well, I don't think so, no, because if the stock of natural-born tweed fish is diminished to any great extent, then there will be no salmon for anybody. But then aren't the netting people diminishing it very much? How many uh, do they catch in a good day here? Ah, well, I'm afraid I can't divulge figures. But it is a valuable fishing, is it? It's a very valuable fishing. Could you put any figure on the total value of it? No, I couldn't do that, I'm afraid. No. How many no. landowners are involved in this? Uh, about a hundred owners of fisheries. Well, now, this rather more. bears out what the fishermen say, that there's one law for the rich and one for the poor. Well, I think you've got to remember that commissioners don't get it for nothing. They've got to find the staff to administer their river, and I estimate that in the last hundred years they've spent something like a million pounds. Mm -hmm. on ensuring that that breeding stock of salmon remains in the river. Mm -hmm. The sea houses fish, fishermen have so far not produced one penny. How can you be sure that fishing in what are now banned waters would seriously affect the fishing? Isn't it rather natural factors? No, because you've got to remember that all those fish out in the bay are tweed fish which are just waiting to come in. Mm -hmm. They've been bred in our river at the expense of the commissioners. Do you really need such a wide area of banned sea? Couldn't you restrict it, as they suggest, to a mile from the river mouth? Um, I don't think I'd be prepared to answer that. I think we'd have to consider that uh, w Would you be prepared to, to try an experiment and let them fish one season and see what the effect No, I don't think you can do that, because if you allow one person to fish, then there's no reason why the whole of the herring fleet can't come up from somewhere down south and remove every fish there is. Apparently, foreign boats can fish in areas that are banned to local fishermen. Um, no, I don't agree with that at all. I don't think well, the them. international limit is only three miles. Your limit is five. There's nothing to hinder a foreign boat coming in and fishing in these two miles, is there? Well, I, I no, I don't agree with that. I think that would have to be a, a, a test case in court before that could be established. We don't believe that. But the only way to find out would be to try, wouldn't it? Yes. The sea houses men say that thousands of salmon are taken out of the river and buried every year. Surely that shows that there are enough salmon for everybody. Well, that just simply is not true. We do have heavy mortality among fish after they spawned, mm -hmm. when they're kelts. Mm -hmm. It is perfectly natural mortality. It means, it means they've grown old, the same as you and I are but, growing but, old but now. 
Surely not thousands of them. Uh, a very large number. But as I understand it, a salmon doesn't spawn till October, from October to December. Starts in about October. Well then, what about the fish that are going up the river now? They're going, they're going slowly up the river to their spawning grounds. They, there's no, they come in as early as January, they travel slowly up the river, and arrive on the spawning grounds about October. But they don't eat between now and October. No, we, we don't well, think they do. Well, the seahouses men say they die because they're not eating. No, well, I mean, it's a natural thing of a salmon that it doesn't eat when it's in the river, as far as we know. Is it not true, then, as they say, that if a salmon isn't caught, no, it'll die? No, it's not true. It will spawn first, and many, many, many of them will come back to the sea without dying. It's a noble fish, the salmon, is it not? And it's big business. These are tough days for inshore fishermen, but, you know, this dispute's not as simple as it might seem at first sight. Don't you agree? Good night. And on that note, we end our programme for tonight. A lot of you have been telephoning, asking how Derek is. Well, he's very much better. He's coming on a pace very strongly indeed. He won't be back with us, I'm afraid, for uh, some weeks yet. But he asked me to say thank you very much indeed to all of those who wrote, sent him cards, flowers. He's absolutely snowed under down there. Thank you very much indeed. Now we bid you good night. The next tonight will be tomorrow night. Good night. Such was the popularity and perceived power of tonight that the BBC took it off the air for the duration of the 1959 election campaign. Good ideas, though, are hard to kill.